Praise the Lord, everyone. What a blessing to be in the Lord's house, to be wrapped in his everlasting loving arms, to be right up in his lap, to hear his beautiful voice singing and rejoicing over us. I don't know anything more wonderful. And honestly, it just, I suppose it will never be normal. It always hits me, especially in times of deep prayer and reflection. I was speaking to Brian a little bit as he was warming up uh, on his guitar and making sure it was in tune. I was telling him that last night when we were singing the song, I think it's called Find Me Faithful, how I identified, number one, something about, and I don't understand it, it is a great mystery, it's also a wonderful, tremendous gift that the Lord has given to us. Something about music is very real, and I think at its bottom, it is spiritual. It just is. That it is conveying powerful things that are true and changing us, literally changing us. There's power in it. So something about the mood that is set by that melody and its rhythm is taking me to a place that's very real, though not physical, and I'm awash in it. And I feel the Lord present. I feel his presence, and I know, I know that there's nothing else like it. And then as he begins to sing, I feel that in my heart. I feel what he means when he says, I bow my face to the ground. I can't remember the words precisely, so forgive me for that. But basically, with my face in the dirt, until my heart rises above my head, I get that. I feel that. That's the, that's the push that I myself have to make each time that I'm seeking the Lord's presence. And I'm not just checking off a to-do list. I'm not just going through the motions. I want to see him. I want to hear him. I want to feel his touch. And more than that, too. I don't just want that. I do. I mean, my, for myself, I want that. But also, I will explode if I don't get to do something for him. Just anything. I don't care. I don't care. Whatever makes him happy, that's what I want to do. I, I feel that need. I feel that, like, like it is a fire in my bones. And if I don't, that I, it will just consume me. And so, I mean, when we open in, in praise, it's so powerful to me. It takes me, and you'll forgive me, it takes me a moment to change modes and to go into the sermonette. If you will, brethren, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. What I'd like to talk to you about today, let's we'll see what the Lord has to teach us here from his word. Uh, it's on the subject of witnessing. And I don't know if it's helpful for you, but it is helpful to me, so I'm just going to boil it down to a very simple statement. Here it is. You don't have to be smart. You don't. You don't have to be full of knowledge to be an effective witness. What you have to do is actually meet the Lord. You have to be in his presence and then tell people about that. That's it. And statement number two, success is not necessarily only when people respond with love back to the Lord and choose to be faithful. Success is defined by showing up. That's it. It's just not complicated. And I find that very powerful, and I'll tell you why. Because in my personal life, you all know, uh, some of you who are here may not know, that I was raised in the Worldwide Church of God, and we were a nonprofit organization, if you know what I mean. We were not taught to evangelize. We were not encouraged to witness to others the gospel, the good news, our personal experience with Jesus. If anything, and this is the truth, although it saddens me, and I'm, I'm humiliated that I thought this way, but I did. I did. And it was in ignorance and unbelief, as the Apostle Paul would say, this is where I was coming from. We were taught to play goalie. I remember sermons that would tell you how to avoid the subject. It's so wicked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because there was a process. You know, if someone was interested, you could give them a number to headquarters, and they could give them a call. And then if they checked out, they would send a team to the house who would vet them with a polygraph, and I don't know what else. And yeah, I am being facetious a, a little, but just a little. So... I mean, that's where I came from. And so when I became a Christian, I had a warped sense of, what do you do with that? I mean, can I? Is it possible for me, as one who was so 
desperately lost, and I wish there were a way to convey it to you. I can't. You know it from your own hearts. The pain, the torment, the hopelessness, the helplessness. And every time there was what seemed like an illusion, like just an illusory vapor of the thing that I was searching for, immediately when I got it, it would hurt me and take me farther down because they were all lies and Satan was just bashing me from one side to another. That was my life. And in my honest, quiet moments when I didn't have anything to distract me, I had to see that. I just had to see this is who I am and washed with shame, just saturated, soaked with guilt. That was me. And then he showed up at such cost, through such pain, such sacrifice, having publicly worn the shame that I earned for myself. I deserved it bore the pain that really I caused. I brought that pain into this world. My sin did it. I did it. And yet, looking in those eyes and that sound, son, I love you. I know who you are. You're precious to me. I will wash you. I will make you clean. I'll make you my own. I will put my name on you. I will raise you up to places you haven't even dreamed of yet. I will satisfy those desires that you've sought to fill in the ways that it brought you only pain and shame and guilt and humiliation. I'll never forget it. I just never will. So how can I then, experiencing such love at such cost, how do I walk away and then just hold that to myself, knowing people that I see are in that place? I remember that place. I could never, moreover, the one who paid so much, I mean, that's why he paid it, isn't it? I mean, he came to me. I'm not going to go. Of course, I must go. But I say all that to say this. The things that held me back were things like, well, I don't know enough. I mean, they're going to ask me something I won't know the answer to. Yeah, yeah, that's going to happen. Or um, you're afraid that, uh, you know, you don't have yourself together enough, maybe. That's another thing. Well, you know, I see my faults and flaws very clearly. Yeah. And before the Lord comes back or you draw your last breath that day, you're going to still see him. So now what? I mean, we're told to go, so what are you going to do? I remember I had this experience personally. It was soon after I was saved, and I used to like to go and shoot pool. I spent a lot of time down in a nicer, not a dive, but a nicer pool place. And there I met someone who had known me before I was saved. And to know me before I was saved was to know someone who was just out loud a sinner in public, you know, shaking his fist at God. That was me. And immediately he knew there was something different about me. I don't even know. Probably showed on my face and the way that I looked. And I don't even know. I don't know what I said to him, but it was clear. And here's what happened. Like, first it was shock and awe. That was the first response. And then the second response was, you know, when he said, what's up? And I said, well, I've been saved. It's the most wonderful thing. I mean, you have no idea. You haven't even started yet, man. And he looked at me and he said, you're a hypocrite. Yeah, I know you. I remember the stuff you you used to do. And he started giving me some of my greatest hits, you know, which I knew. I mean, the Lord knew. So yeah, and the Lord had to do it, but in that moment, the Spirit moved me, and I just said, you know what, you're right. I'm a hypocrite in this sense. I don't live up fully to the standard of the Lord, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a statement and then ask you a question. Here's the statement. I'm less a hypocrite than I was a year ago. How you doing? Because that's the question, isn't it? So there's no good reason for us not to, and I find in these two examples, if we're able to get to both of them, It's very powerful in teaching us lessons and how to be effective witnesses. So here we are, John chapter 4. I'm just going to start in verse 7. And as you know, uh, this is about the woman of Samaria. So there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now in in the verses that came before, it says it's about noon. You should be aware. You don't go out in the heat of the day and draw water. She was probably avoiding people, probably because of shame, which we will see as we go along. So it's noon, Jesus is sitting there, and here comes this Samaritan woman. And so on every basis, he had no business talking to her. A rabbi in those days, in good conscience, would cross the street rather than to share the sidewalk with a woman. 
It was considered improper to do otherwise. So it was weird for a rabbi to be talking to a woman. And worse, a Samaritan woman. They were considered traitors and half-breeds. They were really looked down on. Nobody liked the Samaritans. But here's Jesus, and he has an appointment. I mean, he's here for this. And that should inform us, too. I mean to say, our Father orders our steps. Our Father puts us in the jobs that we're in, the schools that we're in, with the families that we have, and the circle of influence that we enjoy, the stores where we shop. Nothing is accidental. Everything is an appointment. Everything, every time. And you are the person. If they're being brought to you, you're the right person to witness to them. That's just it. It shouldn't be someone else. You are right. And you don't have to understand it, but it is to me very helpful to know it. So here's Jesus, and he says, give me a drink. In verse 8, his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. So the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, and I, a subtext, she's shocked. I mean, she's stunned because this doesn't happen. And she's probably used to being shunned by everyone, even over and above the societal norms where rabbis don't speak to women. And so she says to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? since I'm a Samaritan woman. So she's addressing the elephant in the room right off the bat. And Jesus is using that. And it, this is something very simple. We can all do it. It's thirst. He's using thirst. Thirst is a normal thing. People have to drink. People have to eat. People have to work. Hunger, thirst, sleeping. These things are common to all people at all times in every place. But Jesus knows why we're thirsty. Because he made us to thirst. We didn't have to be built that way, did we? That was God's divine design was for us to thirst. Because it's to remind us we need him to live. Look, breath by breath, we need him to fill us with life. That's the reality that this physical breathing tells forth. Breath by breath. How it is that we don't understand that we utterly depend on him, I don't know. Because he's filled our lives with reminders. If we don't breathe, we don't live. If we don't have the Lord, same. And it's that, it's moment by moment. Heartbeats the same. And so is drinking, and so is eating. So Jesus is just using thirst. It's a, it's a physical, lesser reflection of a much higher and greater reality. And he's going to get to her through this example. Why? Because he was sitting at a well, and there's another thing. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't where you are. It doesn't. You can be walking a trail or be out fishing or driving in a car. There's no place you can go. And you see Jesus do it all the time. He says, you know, observe the lilies of the field, you know, which today are here and tomorrow are gone. But I want you to think about something when you see that. Think about this. Solomon, who is the wealthiest man ever, he never was dressed as beautifully as those. And yet, I mean, how much more important is a man than God? So don't you think God can take care of you? He's telling you a truth. Why? Based on something real and present. That's powerful. We can all do that. We can all do that. And, of course, the, the Holy Spirit can inspire us. But I just notice this as a pattern. It's whatever is close at hand. It's just whatever is there. It reminds me of when the Lord said to Moses, what's that in your hand? I mean, that's the question, isn't it? Or when Jesus said to the disciples, how are we going to feed these people? Of course, he knew. What did he do? He just took what they had. Did they have to carry truckloads of food to feed? No. No. And you know, I used to see that parable as an example of you don't have to have a lot of money to serve the Lord because he will supply the money. <laughs> it's true, but that's not the point. You don't have to know everything. If you have the Lord in you, he will take that living bread and multiply it and feed people. And that's really feeding people. More than a meal, eternal life. So he just uses the example of water. He's like, give me something to drink. They said, how are you asking me that? And Jesus says in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now here's something. Jesus had knowledge. We all have that access through the Holy Spirit. That's why we pray for the gifts and earnestly desire him. Those gifts are tools in our tool belt. They are very useful. So he had a word of knowledge about her. He understood this is a thirsty woman. When they start getting into the next part of it, you're going to understand, you see. But he's addressing what is at the bottom. 
So she said, sir, you don't have anything to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and the sons of his cattle. And by the way, you can see the light is dawning on this woman. Because that's an important question, isn't it? It's just like when the man came up and said, good teacher. And Jesus said, there's no man that's good. Just one. That's the father. He's the only one that's good. P.S. Are you calling me God? Because if I'm God, you better listen. Yeah. And so the fact that she's saying that, you know, are you greater? She, you can tell. There's just an inkling there that she understands she's having a divine moment. This isn't just some random dude sitting at a well. She's thinking to herself, could this be the Lord? And something in her is witnessing. That's another thing. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. We receive it at baptism. We stir it up day by day. It begins to flow out of us as we reach that place in God's presence and, and linger there. Let him talk to us. Let him minister to our needs. Be honest about what your needs are before him. There's no sense trying to hide it. He knows it. He knows it. So look... And I've told someone this recently. I read the Psalms. I'm impressed with how honest David is. And David understood it because when he was repenting in Psalm 51, he said, you desire truth in my inmost part. And I mean, truth all the way down to the bottom, to my very first prime assumptions about who I am. And Listen, you think that's a small thing. It's not a small thing. I confront lies that are buried deep in my heart all the time. Life brings it up. I'll give you an example. It was a couple of feasts ago where uh, the big daddy came to me on the night, the evening, when we worship before the last, or it's on the last great day, but it's the evening of the last great day. Anyway, so unexpectedly, as I'm there praying with him, he just takes my face in his hands and he's picking it up, which is saying, you know, let me have your face. Quit bearing your face. I want to see your face, which we do when we love people. That's normal, you know. Uh, but I didn't want to do it. I wanted to, I didn't want that. And it wasn't really about Big Daddy. It really wasn't. It was really about the Lord and me, my Heavenly Father. And He knew that, of course. Why was I resistant? Why did that have to break through? Well, there still is the residue of a lie that my Father doesn't love me, that He's angry with me, that, you see, there's, there's a wrong kind of fear, it's more like, I feel rejected. Now, I don't really believe that cerebrally, but it doesn't mean that it's not deep, deep in my heart, you see. So we have to examine those things. And as we go into his presence and we're there and we're honest in our prayer, we're reflecting on all of the past history every time. Every time that I go through, it's, it, I don't know what to call it. It's like a parade of my life. It's like rooms that I visit, and they're, they're all scenes of these pivotal, important, powerful, impactful moments in my life. I go there, and I remember. I remember when I was delivered. I remember when he whispered to me, you complete my joy. When he said, you are a song to me. When he said, behold, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I remember every moment when he used me to do something good. And then every result that I see, I have them. They are on prominent display in the halls of my active memory. I don't know how to describe it to you, but that's how it is. I visit it often because it reminds me of his power and it informs me about going forward but the reason I bring this up is because it's there he is filling me as a vessel I am being filled to overflowing and I just can't shut up I mean I can't help myself it's going to come up and people are going to ask me questions because I'm so full of joy and thanksgiving for what God has done for me there's, if you squeeze me, that's coming out, because that's how it is. So in the same way, we have these rivers of living water. They are flowing out of us. That's Jesus, and Jesus is the answer. Jesus is what people need. If they're thirsty, that's what they need. They're hungry, that's what they need. they trapped, that's what they need. Confused, that's what they need, you see. He's the light in their darkness. And that's, it's Jesus. It is really genuinely Jesus that we bring, and it's flowing out of us. So, Jesus answered, and he says, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. And that's how it is. But 
Verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, but that water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And I don't know how much of this she's understanding because of her response saying, sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty or come to, to the, come all the way here to draw. And so she still doesn't get what he's saying. This is eternal life. This is going to fill the thirst you really have. So she's seen it in practical terms. And so now here's the pivot point. This is the moment of truth, literally the moment of truth. Go get your husband. Now, this could go one of two ways. This could go like the rich young ruler. Could she just walk away? Sorrowful. That could happen. She could lie. Many people do. Don't think that that would be a strange reaction. That'd be a common reaction. Here's the thing, and he addresses it in the other example, which I know that we won't have time to get to, but you'll find it in chapter 9, blind Bartimaeus, you know. The problem is not that people are not blind, and it's not that God can't make them see. The problem is most blind people don't know they're blind. Most starving people are like the Laodicean church. They think they're wealthy. They think that they're increased in that they're, they're living uh, luxuriously and opulently, especially true of America, especially true here. But what Jesus said is right. The truth is you are wretched and naked and blind, but he's not going to heal you against your will. If you can't be honest with him about you're broken, I'm broken. I, and again, I say, when I look through the Psalms and I see how David speaks, sometimes I just think I could never say that to the Lord. Well, that's my problem. That's my problem. If I can't say it, then he can't fix it for me. I mean, he has the power to do it, but he doesn't have my permission yet, does he? And he's going to wait. He's going to wait until the weight of it breaks me enough that I will holler, that I'll say it, that I'll go. You don't go to the doctor unless you're sick. That's how it works. So why would I hide it? So now do I say to the Lord, Lord, I am tired. Yeah, that's the place. Now, I don't say it with every person. There's wisdom to be had. There are intimate people that you can share deep things with, and you know who they are. It's based on their track record, and it's the relationship the Lord has given you with them, and that's a blessing. It's a tremendous blessing. You don't have to present a persona to the Lord. He sees it already. He sees all the way deep down. Why would I hold it in? I am angry. I am hurt. I am confused. You know, I feel lost. I feel lonely. I feel afraid. Tell him. You know what's odd? I don't know how this works, but it works this way. Here's David, and David, man, does he, he's being honest with the Lord when he's praying. He's doing it. I cried all night. I can't get any rest. I don't ever see you anymore. Do you even love me? Are you ever going to help? The people who are evil are better off than I am. What's all this for? I mean, wow, right? But look, look what happens as a result. Almost every time that he does that, the Lord will lead him through to the other side of that. So he goes in broken and he comes out whole. He goes in exhausted. He comes out energized. He goes in hopeless. He comes out full of faith. It's amazing, isn't it? That's how it works. So that's why I'm not, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry, not one bit. If I tremble in prayer, praise the Lord. If I cry because it's the deep pain or agony of my heart, praise the Lord. Let the tears flow. What did that stoic, stony guard that I put on my heart ever do for me anyway? But wear me out. So praise the Lord for it. So this is a moment of truth where Jesus is presenting, go call your husband. And she's ready. She's ready to receive from him because here's her answer, verse 17. I have no husband. And Jesus says, yeah, you've said that correctly. You have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the one whom you are now with, or the one whom you now have, is not your husband, and you told me the truth. That means that this can go somewhere. This is hopeful. If you're willing to say the truth about where you are, that means that your salvation is really at hand. It's right in front of you. And it should inform you about what might she be thirsting for? What do you think? I mean, you know, she's going through husband after husband. I think she wants to be loved. That's what I would, at the bare minimum, I would say that about her, that she's thirsty for that. Where are any of us going to find that? In the Lord. Now, that's where it is. That's where our cups get filled, and no person will ever do that for us. Nobody can. Now, people can contribute, and that is a wonderful blessing, but there's no human being that can give you what the Father alone, what Jesus alone have to give to you. And here's the thing. We don't go, huh, 
That's an old proverb, you know. Beware of a naked man selling you a shirt, right? So we don't go out thirsty and offer living water. We go out full. Our vessels are full and we're overflowing because he's met our needs. And once that's happened, well, then we're free for people to fluctuate, which as Jesus, you know, said of Jesus, he knew what was in man. He knew. We ought to know. And that way we should be wise as serpents. We ought to know that people are like that. We're like that. So we don't look to them to be our rock and our strength. The Lord is that for us. So she told him the truth, and then he said, yeah, that's right, and he read her mail, which is an evidence, by the way. That's the moment when she knows, yeah, that thing that I was thinking might be true, that's true. So the woman said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And she, she's sidetracking. This is, this, is, this is a deflection. Is what this, She's bringing up a religious thing. And look, we all do that. I, I'm reminded of, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build a tabernacle for you. If, yeah, no, no. So he's not going to have that. He's going to come right back to the issue at hand. And he says, woman, believe me, an hour's coming. When neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father, you worship what you don't know. You people don't know. We worship what we do know. Salvation is from the Jews. Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. Yeah, salvation is from the Jews. That's what it means. But an hour is coming, and now is. So let's talk about this hour, all right? Not that nonsense. And now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. That's what matters. It ain't about geography. He didn't have to get into the details about you're going to be a temple. Isn't that what he was saying when he said those living waters are going to flow out of you? You're going to be the temple. And uh, time fails us to, to get into it, but you couldn't. You know, God's presence was so protected. Think about it. Think about Uzzah reaching out and grabbing the ark. Think about what would have happened if somebody tried to just touch that veil and go into the Holy of Holies. And yet he's saying, God will live in you. There's nothing more astounding than that. There just isn't. He seeks worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I'm just going to skip down uh, for the sake of time. The disciples come to him. So he explains to the disciples the fields are already ripe for harvest as this woman goes back. And look, the woman went out. Let's see if I can find it. Left her water pot. Okay, verse 29. She says, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? So two things are important to note. Number one, this woman was afraid of them a minute ago. She was hiding from them. That's why she's out getting water when nobody would be out there. She's not scared now. Why? What's the difference? Well, she's seen the Lord. That's the difference. When you've seen the Lord, it's so big, it just swallows up all those little things. I used to say to my friend, Damon McQuaig, I said, you know, if you've got one fear, that's all the fear you'll need. If you fear the Lord, that's it. Nothing else is so scary when you fear him. If not, then you'll be afraid of everything else. And that's the truth. So she's not scared. Number two, she didn't get her act together. These are people who knew her. They were from her village. They were familiar with her life. Did that matter? No. I mean, did it mean that she had not met the Lord? The Lord wasn't who he said he was and couldn't do for them what he had done for her, by the way. I mean, you don't think that it hit these people? Well, wait, isn't that that woman that's so immoral and always skulked around trying to avoid eye contact with us? And now look, I mean, she's shouting in the public square. This is a different woman. Who could have done that? Right. And that's us. And it's not after a whole long time. I mean, it's immediately after you meet the Lord. That's who you are. You are a big neon billboard flashing salvation at people. It's in you. And you're an expert on that. It's, you don't have to study it in books. You've met the Lord in person. He's delivered you and set you free. I mean, it's, it's a powerful thing. Verse 39, just skip on down to that point. So from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. She didn't say anything fancy. All she did was say, this man told me everything I ever did. But of course, she was displaying in her person that she was radically changed, and that's part of the message. But it's not complex. 
It's not erudite. She didn't read a bunch of books. She didn't go to seminary, you know. And if you want to look at it, I find a lot of meaning in the example of Bartimaeus, the young man that was healed. Jesus healed his blindness, and then he was called before the Sanhedrin to explain himself. So powerful. A beggar had no formal education, none whatsoever, and yet he was called before the most educated, most powerful people, and I mean, he made them look stupid. Well, they made them look stupid. He just helped show them that. It's beautiful. And to me, and I hope that for you, it, it helps, to, helps to understand. You don't have to be some big, lofty uh, PhD at all. In fact, if anything, in my experience, that hurts your case a bit. It just does, because usually those people are arrogant. It's just not very effective. But, I mean, there's, you know, there's no place for the devil to hide when he runs into Jesus inside of us. Praise the Lord.